something's going on, eBay's broken. I can't verify any of that. I don't even worry about views, watchers, or impressions, or whatever. I have validated the sales numbers. The dollars have been good. Welcome to Aspen Postcards. Today, I've got four things like normal. I've got the cards that I sold. I'll go through them real quick, talk about them. I've got a couple more Hawaii cards. And then for the special topic, we got mill postcards. They're kind of like factories, but they're mills. There's water mills, grist mills. It's probably one of the harder ones for me to go and pick out because mills are mills. But then there's factories and different things. But some of the cards came out with a pretty good price. Wait till you see that. Then for the poll section today, how organized are you in your reselling business? I go through a poll, are you over organized, just right, or just an absolute disaster? And we got some comments from a few people and I'll, I'll let you know what I do and what my thoughts on it are. And then in the viewer comments, one of the comments I got was from a person saying their impressions on eBay are down and how are mine doing? So I'm going to talk a little bit about what I think of those numbers and how I use them in my business, in my decision making, at the end of the video with the viewer comments. But let me go ahead and get started with what's sold. Before I show you the cards, I just want to let you know, I've had a couple refunds. Some, there was a batch of cards I sent out one day during the week. It just took forever for these cards to get there. And I ended up refunding a couple people because they were just triggered. It just wasn't coming. And, so I, I just refunded them, but guess what? Like normal, the cards did end up showing up. This was one of them. This is the Severn River Bridge in Annapolis, right here. That one came in and I refunded them and they sent me a message. They sent it in the mail back to my PO box because I refunded them and the card showed up. It says, Dear Mark, it was kind of you not to ask for this postcard back. Because when I refunded them, I said, don't worry about sending it back. Because to send a stamp and do all this stuff, it just doesn't work. I just tell them to keep it, unless it's a higher price card. But since I have no need for it, and since I have some ancient 83 cent stamps, I can never figure out a use for it. Probably only need to mail this, but I'm hoping to use them up in their lifetime. I thought I'd mail it back to you. Return to your inventory, since after all, you have restored my money to my pocket. Roberta. Postcard people are just the nicest people. Most of your customers, 99.9%, .9 are like Roberta in the postcard world. And, and generally in public, they're really nice people. And that just reinforces that. Then I went to the P.O. Box and I have another card. This one's from Roger. I refunded Roger. Guess what? The Kiwi postcard finally arrived 12 days after it was mailed. I could have pushed it out a little bit more, but Roger was, I felt I needed a refund. Thank you for the refund, but I don't believe in giving something for nothing. Be well, Roger. He had a $5 bill put in here. He sent me a $5 bill. So I, I, I can't say what I can say about these people that it's very nice. Every time I go to the P.O. Box, I get something like that. It's it's interesting what I pull out. But there, if you refund people, you know they're pretty nice people out there. Don't gauge the whole world on just one or two people. Well, the first card I sold, I just listened to this the other day. I didn't really know what to do with it. It's scenic Hillsdale, New York. It's a quiet trout pool in Jansen Kill. It's a guy in a pond. I listed it and it sold four to five dollars. Then I sold this card. I got 63 of these left. It's the Iowa, USS Iowa. And it's doing a full broadside. It's uh, shooting the guns. I, I sold this card before, but I got 63 of them left. Sold four to five dollars. This gentleman, I, I got a bunch of these exhibit cards, these arcade cards of older actresses. This is Diana Shore in all sincerity. These are ones I said that you can find in vending machines back then or whatever They're, they don't have a postcard back but I got a bunch of those at an auction the older ones don't sell as good for me as the newer 80s 90s stars this gentleman came in one night I was sitting there doing something it was later at night and he came in and he sent me a message and usually I don't look at offers and stuff but I looked at this one because one of these popped up on the phone I'm sitting there let me take a look at this one he offered like a certain price for one of them and I said let me bump it up a little bit so I had some back an offer took it 
Then he came back again, want another one. Take it. Then the next day I woke up, I found he wanted this one. A little lower price, I gave it to him. He bought three of these actors cards from me in less than 24 hours. So I made like 20 bucks from three cards that have been sitting there for a while. And I didn't have a lot of high hopes on it. This one sold for four dollars. Diana Shore. Been there for a while. Move the inventory. I didn't I probably paid less than a nickel for that. Not even that. Next one is Mandam Slant Village and Museum. Old Fort Lincoln. North Dakota. A North Dakota card. It's a field. I don't see a village. Is that the village? Somebody knows something about that. So, four to five dollars. Then I bought a bunch of those whole YMCA cards from, I think it was a Mary Martin auction a while ago. I'm just getting to them. That's how far back I am with my organization, where it is in the queue of my cards I got. I just don't take the cards I buy and put them up front because you, you'll you'll never list the ones. You keep pushing some back. So I have cards that are scanned. I just keep listing and going through my thing. But this is Hawthorne Street showing YMCA building. It was made in Germany. Older card. Sold for $7.65. I've sold probably half a dozen of these YMCA cards so far that I listed. I probably put about 800 of them up. Six to 800 YMCA cards. They were pretty easy to list. YMCA building Albany, New York. YMCA building Springfield, Illinois. It was just not a lot to put on them. But some of them I did comp when it looked the towns and stuff and some were most of them were between five and eight dollars there was a couple that went higher to 1265 to twenty dollars but not many they were mostly average cards and I have a video on YMCA postcards that talk about the history of the YMCA next card I sold sold for five ninety nine this is the windjammer in Cincinnati it's a boat multi view of a boat Sold for $5.99. Next one I got, this one is Diversity Harbor in Chicago. One of the Harbors in Chicago linen card. I see a lot of these. They, they're average cards. $45. This one's the Brown Gymnasium. Offices of the coaching staff, William Jewell College, Liberty, Missouri. It's a building. It's a gym. $4 to $5. Next one sold for $7.65. This is the Surf Bathing at Jacob Riles Park, Rockaway Beach. So you always want to check your beaches. I always count beaches. If there's any kind of beach, I don't take a chance. I go and look and I usually get a few extra dollars. This one is in Long Island, New York, and it's just a linen card posted in 1940. Somebody had $2 on there one time. I don't take all that off. It's the history of the card. $7.65. Route 66 card, abandoned adobe shacks, abandoned adobe shacks, old houses, sold for $5. Then we get into two Hawaii cards. This sold for $7.65. This is a multi-view of Maui, and I listed a lot of these cards in a big box I found of Hawaii cards before the disastrous fire started. This is Lahaina. Um, I think that right down here to Harbor, Lahina, Lahina Yacht Harbor. So that's probably why it sold. Then I sold another Hawaii card. These are the Tahitian dancers. And then this one is Big Bend National Park, Texas, four to five dollars. All that Tahitian dancers sold five to six dollars. Just a view card of some mountains in Big Bend, four to five. View cards will sell. They will sit. But they do sell. So I sold a total of 13 cards for $74.36 yesterday. Average sale price, $5.72. Goals for this year in 2023 was to do 14 cards a day is what I like to do for the year. I'm right at 13 a day, and I'm right at 13 for the year. So I'm not really killing it out there. I got a lot of cards up, and they are selling to what I want. I was looking at 14. I'm at 13. I want to do $70 a day. I'm over that for the year average. Definitely over that. I don't put a flea market in that. This is just eBay that I track for this. And I'm at 74.36 today, so I met that target. I was one down on the card, 13. I met the $70, and my ASP is going up. Now you should be starting to look at 2024, what you want to do. I'm going to keep the same goals. 
14 cards a day, $70 a day, increase ASP, but one of my other goals is to be very strategic, very picky, more picky than I was this year on buying postcards. I want to probably move up a little bit in the price range, but I'm also looking for like one big 20,000 lot of like trains or planes or something, NASA, you know, just one big lot of one related topic. I've done very well with the Navy ships and I'd like to duplicate that. I got a lot of other cards on there. So I'm being a little bit more picky on what I do and I'm watching my prices a little bit and stuff like that. This year was a year of me cutting back. I mean, I cut so far without hurting quality or my procedures and stuff on my expenses. It's ridiculous. I was able to cut almost $4,000 a year out of my business this year. And it's taken me all year to do this. And I did put some upfront money to do it, but now I'm starting to see my expenses going down and my profits going up. So the red line going down and the profits going up then the sales are staying nice and steady I'm not killing it I'm not here to tell you I got the magic formula that's going to sell more cards than anybody else I don't do that I am just want to do the I want to be the best average postcard seller with the best average sales I can get I'm not looking to break records one of my last things we did is I find I've been saying it all year I finally got done with the doing the shows at the flea market and stuff like that. All my stuff's gone, and I sold my trailer. Last show was Saturday. I sold it on Monday. I paid $2,400 for that trailer five, six years ago. I was asking $2,400 because the price of the trailers went up. I just wanted to move it. I got my use out of it. Someone else can use it. Guy contacted me. I said, I'm firm on the price. I knew it would sell. It's in good condition. He came here. I melted he flipped out the money, bunch of money. I just melted. I went to 2300 So basically, after amortizing that on my taxes and everything for five years, which you can do when you buy a piece of equipment like that, that's over. I won't have any more tax deductions from it. And I'm done with it. And I got my use. So I took $2,300 for that trailer. So I basically rented that trailer for five years, five, six years for $100. So that's gone. The trailer's gone. I just got like a couple dozen tables and some tubs that I'll be selling here this week and get rid of that. But all the all the inventory's gone. We donated a lot of it. Uh, bring some stuff over to the guys at the toy store. And but I'm done with that. So that's another thing I'm cutting back on was the flea market. It wasn't doing as much as wanted. Plus it was getting hot and I can't lift as much as I used to. I feel it for like three days after I lift that stuff. But that just cut, cut, cut. When the sales are not are like this, you got to keep a steady expense. You got to manage your expenses, and you can't overbuy. That's what's sold. Now we're going to get into special topic: mills, factories, kind of like, but not really factories. They're mills. There were some cards in here that were went for really good money, probably higher than the ones I've done lately in videos. Kind of, I had to double check on them. But it, I had to go through and I had to sort through these things because mills and coffee mills, there was a lot of stuff popping up. So there might be a few things in here. So we'll adjust, when I get to the sell-through rate, we'll adjust that in the range a little bit because uh, there was just a lot to go through with this one. And the history on these, I had to really dig down because what they call mills in the old days and what they call mills today, it was a little confusing, but I think I got it. And I, I do spend a little bit of time reading this stuff and probably too much time reading stuff you guys don't see me, I, I got to take out. It'd be, otherwise, we'd have a five-hour video. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to talk a little bit about mills so you get a good foundation. All these videos are based on a foundation to tweak your curiosity about cards to give you one more card to look at when you're looking through that box at the show or you're looking through an album or you're at an antique store and you're looking through a basket of cards. Oh, there's a mill. Mark talked about mills. These got a higher percentage. I can get that for 50 cents? Sure, I'll take a chance. Those are the types of things. I want to build a foundation for you. So you have it. You don't have to know everything about Mills. You just got to know, yeah, that's a better risk than taking a Big Ben National View card or a Niagara Falls card. You, you 
kind of, well, if you watch the videos, you kind of get pretty good at that. I can go through a box of cards pretty quick. Will I miss some? Always. Will I pick up some duds? Always. But the majority of the cards I pick up will pay for my day and make my business money. Now, will they sit? Yeah, some of them. Postcards are long tail. And long tail means it's going to take a while to sell once you buy it. So if you invest a thousand dollars into a postcards, you probably won't get your return as fast if you bought a thousand dollars worth of iPhones. Well, you can get one iPhone. Or, bad analogy. Something that you, you know, marbles or something. It's another one that's going to take a long time. But if you buy something that's hot, it's probably going to move and get your money back faster. So if you're not able to do the waiting game, you want to fill your store with other things that move a little quicker than postcards. Postcards are great fillers to fill those valleys. When sales are really high and all of a sudden they drop down for a week or two, down to the bottom and then come back up. It's like a roller coaster lately. You don't want them to drop as far, so you put in some filler items like postcards that will curve that drop and bring you back up and keep the cash flow coming in. Cash flow is so important nowadays to pay your bills. you got to have cash coming in. And to get a ka-ching on a phone at least two, three times a day always makes people happy. It, it's just one of those things. But I'm going to go ahead and talk about mills, and I'm going to show some mill postcards I found while I do that. The history of mills in the United States is deeply intertwined with the Industrial Revolution and the growth of the nation. Mills played a crucial role in transforming the United States from society to an industrial powerhouse. The industri industrial earliest mills in America were grist mills. Well, you'll see some of those which were used to grind grain into flour. These mills were often located near rivers or streams to harness the power of water to turn the millstones. As the demand for manufactured goods increased, mills diversified their operations and began to specialize in different industries. This is where the mills, the grist mills and stuff got a little crazy for me. There's textile mills, for example, emerged in the 18th century and became a significant part of the American economy. These mills used water power machinery to process raw cotton in the finished textiles, such as cloth and yarn. They were concentrated in the New England region, where abundant water resources and skilled workforce were available. The rise of mills in the United States not only spurred economic growth, but also led to the development of factory towns and expansion of transportation networks to facilitate the distribution of goods. Over time, mills in the United States evolved technology, moving away from water power and adopting steam engines, and later electric power. The introduction of new machinery and manufacturing techniques led to increased productivity and efficiency in the mills, contributing to the growth of American industries. By the late 19th and 20th centuries, mills have become major industrial centers employing thousands of workers and producing wide range of goods including textiles, paper, lumber, and steel. The Industrial Revolution brought about by mills had a profound impact on the social and economic landscape of the United States. It led to urbanization as workers flocked to mill towns in search of employment opportunities. However, it also gave rise to labor issues, with workers fighting for better wages, working conditions, and labor rights. Despite the challenges, mills remained a vital part of the American economy well into the 20th century, with many iconic mill buildings still standing today as a testament to their historical significance. Here's a few, couple, three facts I found about mills. The oldest operating mill in the United States is the Bale Grist Mill. And remember, a grist mill is where they grind the wheat into flour and the grain into flour. That's a grist mill. It's in California, built in 1846. It is still in operation today, producing stone ground flour. So 1846, and this thing's still going. Oh, I just sold a postcard. And they paid. It is a real photo postcard of Road and, Road and Row Houses, York, United Kingdom. And that's sold for 888. So I sold a real photo postcard international. 
888. The next fact is the Pillsbury A Mill in Minneapolis, Minnesota once held the title of the largest flour mill in the world. It could produce enough flour in one day to make 12 million loaves of bread. That is a lot of bread. Then the Jenny Grist Mill in Plymouth, Massachusetts is believed to be the same mill where the pilgrims ground their corn after they arrived in 1620. It has been restored and is now a working museum. I'd love to just go and see those things. But that's a little bit about mills. So there's grist mills that do the flour, then it turn into textiles, they use water power, they use steam engines, and it, and it went into electric. Uh, just a lot of different places. But do they sell? Now I keep this little range up now in the videos because it this, this is how I think about sell through rate when I'm looking through boxes. I don't have to know comp every card. When you're looking through a box, you can't sit there and comp every card. You're going to be there for hours. You just got to be educated and have a little bit of thrill and guessing what you're pulling out. Don't pay a lot for the ones that you don't know for sure, but then also you might pay a lot for some because you just know in your gut that that card's going to be worth more. That's what makes postcard collecting enjoyable is the hunt. You're going through a box of cards and you find that one card that paid for your whole day. Or you find that one rare card that you want to keep in your collection. A lot of resellers are collectors. I'm not really. I buy the re I don't have a lot. I got a little novelty collection of cards and stuff, but I don't collect a lot. I do collect some Chicago ones, but nothing major. I, I, I more resell than anything. But when you get into the low ones, 0 to 3 percentage, you'll see the sell rates here in a minute. Low, I'd stay away from. When you first start, you don't know that, and you get stuck with all these Niagara Falls, Cypress Gardens, QSL cards. You just, if it's kind of lower than that, it's not your first pick. Or don't pay a lot for them because they're going to sit if they sell at all. Then you got your average ones, 4 to 7 percent. Those are the ones that pay the bills. These are the ones I look for all the time and will pick up. Yeah, they'll sit a little while sometimes, but they sell. They don't sell for a lot, but they're consistent sellers. But the higher ones, 8 to 10 percent, do a little bit better. You know, those are your train depots. Instead of the train, it might be the train depot. And then you get into your 11 percent plus, your mer Wiki Watching Mermaids, your McDonald's, your Disney's. Those are the ones, I, there's no question, I pull them out. I pick them out. If they're Continentals, whatever, I pull because I know they're going to sell. If I see a Wiki Watching Mermaid, it's coming out of the box. You know, then I'll find out what the price. If they if it's three to four dollars, I'll buy it because I know I can get that for it and it's gonna sell fast. I'm gonna get my money back at least. So that's the gauge I use. And where did and how do I calculate sell through rate? Now remember, this isn't rocket science. This is just numbers eBay gives you. Yeah, you can go in there and put solds and completed and no, this isn't here. This is just a, a guideline. That's all it is to give you more than you got to right now. To say, should I buy this card to resell? I take the solds. I divide it by listed. I times it by 100 to give you a percent. Because humans like to have a nice solid number. They don't want to think. Don't make yourself think doing this. The sell-through rate on mills. Postcard mills. There's 45 sold. 404 listed. With mills in the title. So here's an opportunity. If you have a postcard and it's a textile factory, would you put the word mill in there also? Now there's a di distinction between factories and mills, but not too much. It's, it'll still get people to look at the card. They can make the decision. So mills came out at 11%. Postcard factory, 61 sold, 19%. That's what kind of justified me with the 45, is factories came out at 61 sold. So 19% factories are a little bit higher. Then your assembly line. I put that in there because you got Henry Ford's assembly line. When he created that, and it kind of gets in there, that's 11%. So these are holding around 11%. Then the water mill. I put water mill in there. Yeah, don't use water mill. It 5%. So mills is pretty good. But it can get confused with factories and stuff. So there's some key words you can put in your title or description and stuff like that to get them to look at the card. I would still say these fall in the high, average to high. 
I, I don't think they're very high. I would say they fall in the high and just nipping on the average. It depends what it is and what year it is and condition of the car, as always. And you're always going to have duds and you're always going to have outliers. But if you see a mill, I would pick them up. They're better than your lower average ones, not as high as your wiki watching mermaids, but they're in the green. They're, they're going to go. Sometime. Never guaranteeing a sale, but they're, they're not low and they're not very high. So they're your average card. So don't pay above average price for them. That's basically what this does. Looking through a long box, a white box of cards, digging through, whoop, whoop, pull them out. And then the guy says, okay, 50 cents a piece. Heck yeah. Dollar piece. Heck yeah. Uh, I'll pick them up for that. I just got to make sure I put them in a stack that I know I need, I need to get my dollar back. And I do have another version of the sell to rate document. A little cleaner. There was a few mistakes I found in the last one. Uh, as I'm trying to reformat it, but it, it, I want to keep it simple. Simple for me to do. It's a lot of numbers, but also simple for you to just to look at. To give you an idea where things are at. I'm hopefully going to have one out by the end of the year. And I figure I'm going to probably do it at least once a year. The numbers haven't changed that much. In the postcard world, sell-through rate doesn't change as much as some of the toys and stuff like that. So postcards are pretty static. So I'm going to get one out at the end of the year, first of the year, and it'll be the version 2, 2024, and it's free. Right now you can get version 1 in the Ko-Fi store. Just go download it. It says pay what you want. That's just what Ko-Fi does, like buy me a coffee site. You can put zero in there, no limitations, and download it all you want. Donations are always appreciated. People have, people haven't, it doesn't matter. I do it for me, I might as well share it with you. And I do have some other free stuff in there too. But I also have sleeves and things like that you can buy. And if you're a member, you can get it for 40% off. So check out that little store. It's for sellers. I'm not making a killing over there. I just took everything I've made and just added a whole bunch of stuff. I went out and bought a bunch more inventory, different types of things. Not a lot, but I do have some capital uh, in there. Uh, money tied up into the back stock. Copy is easy. It doesn't cause me a lot of pain. And I think people have gotten some really good deals there. So check that out. Are there any really good mill postcards? Yeah, I found a bunch. I picked out three of them. Look at this one. $241.37. Seven bids in an auction. Real photo postcard. Non tanum. Curtis, Paper Mill, Newark, Delaware. That's the key I'm seeing with the mills and a lot of things is cities and states and the name of the mill. If you put that in the title, it probably triggers some save searches and stuff. So make sure you get that in there. Most of the time it's going to have it on the card. Just type what's in the card and go from there. But $241 for this real photo postcard. Here's another one. Real photo, hard to find lumber mill, sawmill. Lumber mill, sawmill, case, West Virginia. They use the abbreviation and the state. I've seen people do that. Some people say it gets them in search better. I've just always written out the, the state. I don't put the abbreviation unless I run out of characters. You can do either way. Some people think that'll get them up in search. I, I don't go to, to verify that. You can do whatever way you want. I just like it to have it consistent. When you look at my titles in my store, all the the proper words and stuff except for it a are capitalized states are all written out and i, I keep it nice and clean i'm just kind of like that as as you'll see here, here in a second with the organization so i i just like it nice and neat it looks professional it looks like you care it gives that little extra edge it's like walking into a thrift store and if everything's all dusty you're probably saying right away you're saying oh this place sucks it's it's not they don't keep it keep it clean they're not organized in your mind or if you have a nice clean setup in your store it's laid out well it's just another thing to take the rough edges off it's not going to give you all the sales in the world but it just takes the rough makes it makes you want to go to work real photo postcard 1907 222 dollars and 50 cents six bids so you got two auctions there with six to seven bids and that's what you want you want more than one or one person going at it so right there, there's $450, $460 in postcards. And then the last one, Oglesby, Illinois, Chicago, Portland, Cement, Mill, Real Photo, Vintage, $104, six bids. So it looks like these are doing well, Real Photos, in auctions. And this one sold in April, June, and May. 
when those sold. So those are uh, all 2023, and that's what they're going for. So if you got some mill or factories, I would even put the factories in here too. Get those up there, and you can run an auction. If you do, let me know if you run auctions on those. Those are your extreme high, high priced. Then we get into the standard run of postcards that we'll see. Like this one here, 1912 Roxburgh Cotton Mill. Norfolk and Western Depot. $30, one bid. They put that one in an auction, and that's sold. Not bad. I like the water tower sitting there, and you can tell it's a looks like a divided back and with the date, but also just looking at it, you can kind of tell. Then the next one is the 1910 uh, Mill. Where's that at? It's in New Hampshire, Reed's Ferry. And it, shows, it says carriage in there. $30. So right now they're running $30, $29.30. And here's a China old postcard, Chinese Sawmill, Shanghai to France. And that's an example of don't put all caps in there. It, it's the old adage that you're yelling. I mean, but it's harder to read for a human to read if it's all caps because we're looking for punctuation and we read from left to right. And right there, it, it doesn't do anything to get more sales. Just do proper writing is what I always tell people and do it the same. But $29 for that sawmill. So all of those are $29, $30. That's the average for the highs. Then you look at the lows. I don't even put these in my equation because every one of these cards they probably could have got a few extra dollars. I can't sell cards at this price and make money. I don't know how they're doing it. I, they're not. I, I can just say. So $90.95, 99 cents, 99 cents. There's no money there. So I don't I don't even put them in there. I don't put the real, real high ones of the average cards and I don't put the low ones. I look at down the middle. I don't even you're not going to change this the way they do it. I guess they just like to hear the ching and gives them something to do. The sum up mills, check factories, mills. Don't put water mill. That didn't do well. Put grain mill or grist mill, something like that in there. But I wouldn't pass up mill postcards, especially real photos. Don't underprice those. It, it kind of opened my eyes on the mills. And I do take a little extra look in there. And that's what these videos do for me. I hope they do it for you. Is give me an idea going forward that maybe six months from now you'll see some mill postcards. Oh yeah, I remember that. That's what these do. Give me a few extra dollars. And there might be some duds out there too, but as always. But that's mills. Who knew? Now every Saturday I do a poll. I put one out on Saturday, so make sure you're subscribed on here and get the little bell. When they come out, they should give you a notification. I put a poll out and show it to you in your phone or whatever. And you can vote on it. Anybody that votes, I don't even know who they are. But if you leave a comment, it does put your name there, and I could put it into the video. If you want to send me a message more privately, just send it to contact at smpostcards.com, and I'll, I'll see the email. If I haven't got back to anybody, let me know. I'm pretty good about getting back, and I think I've gotten back to everybody. Might not have the answer you're looking for, but I can definitely point you in the right direction, hopefully, or find someone that can. But this poll that came out, another passionate thing, the way people run their business. How organized are you in your reselling business? I thought that was a good question. Way over-organized? 5%. So a lot of people are not way over-organized. Probably, they probably, a lot of them probably are, but they have a different level they want to hit of organized. Organized enough to run your business, 79%. I'm so glad to see that. So if you're organized enough to manage your business, you're winning every day. And then I had to put this in there. Just an absolute disaster. I've seen on some YouTube videos, some people's organizations are just a mess. And then the other was 2%. I'm going to read the three comments I got on the, on the poll so far. We had 56 votes already out of this. And then I'll give you what my thinking of organization and where, how people think and what I think of it. First one trying to learn this said, postcards, very well organized. You almost got to be when you get up in the cards. Easy enough for my wife to find a skew when I'm out of town on business. Yeah, if you got someone else doing it, it's got to be a system that is easy for both of you. You can't have all this cryptic inventory map and X, you know, stuff. Just make it easy. Put a number on it or do something that makes it easy for everybody. 
I, I see a lot of people that where they got multiple people working in and one personal inventory this way and another one will do it that way and all of a sudden they're doing defects because they can't find it because that person is no longer there or whatever you got to make it where if you lift that person out of your business everything still works it's written down somewhere you never sure you're going to have some people in in your business i've had people i've hired if that person left it would hurt the business but everything i built over time if he left yeah it would hurt the business and it would take us a little bit to, longer to do things but that experience is gone we would still survive that's a healthy business so other items not so much i keep telling myself i gotta get on top of it but just keep forgetting yeah it's kind of like out of sight out of mind i understand thanks try it or trying then boldly grow pickers i have a major space issue so everything that is listed is organized yeah you got it your listed stuff is very important because if you can't find what's sold and you got a refund that could you know out of stock option could be a defect on ebay and they don't like a lot of those you can have a few it happens to everybody don't be upset if you can't find a card or if you ship the wrong card to another person. It's going to happen no matter how organized you are. It, I've done it. Other people I know have done it. Been selling for years. It, it will happen. It, for some reason, you had a something happened you didn't think right that day, and you just or you got distracted and you put it in there. You just did it. There's no excuse. I, I just tell people sorry. And I haven't had it happen in a long, long time. But it, it does happen. So what's listed is very well organized. I have no problems finding them when they sell. Unlisted inventory is a whole different story. Yeah, it depends on the size of the stuff you buy. I don't buy big things. I don't have storage in my house for big things. And I had store, three storage units full of stuff. But it was organized on shelves and stuff like that. Two of them were listed inventory. And the other one was stuff that I haven't listed or pulled over yet. I don't have those anymore. I just do postcards and they're all in my office now. It's taken me a year or so to get to that point, but I got rid of all that stuff. Yeah, Boldly Grow, storage is another thing on there. And I'll hit on this in a second. Thanks, Boldy. And then Jackie Jack Enterprises. Todd, I need to get my postcards and Victorian trade cards more organized. Yeah, catch it now. Don't wait. I'm telling you, don't wait. I've been there. I changed mine up three times. And now I'm too at a point where I don't care. It's staying the way it is. I'm not touching 100,000 cards. I got 46,000 listings with a quantity of 100,000. You know how long that would take me to change that and how many mistakes I'd make? No, I'm happy with what I got. I'll live with my little nuances. My books and magazines are good for the most part. Just need more hours in a day. Yeah. If you spend the time to organize, you'll get the hours back. Guaranteed. And you'll get some time back if it was organized and you're not spending as much time looking and doing and working around your stuff but it's just taking the time to do it it's a real struggle what do i do i had this video I've done two of them now i did one about a year or so ago and i updated this one it shows you what i do in the office and some people say wow you're so organized to me i can go to another level but i won't anymore I'm happy I can find everything. Everything's in a spot where it should be. So like that. When I come in my office, everything on my desk is the same. And so I can stop and start. I know where I'm at. And that's probably from just my life, my work life. I worked in restaurants for many years, so we had to plan catering, plan meals, plan staff. I manage, I've been a manager over 35 years. I was a manager at 20 years old. So I've been planning and leading stuff for years. I can make, I'm a good manager can manage anything. I can manage anything. Just give me the data. I don't need to know how to build a rocket, but I can manage a project. I, I'd surround myself with people that know, know rockets. So a good manager doesn't need to know, and it's probably sometimes better they don't know. They can be more, look through the project and get uh, deadlines. So that's why I don't like being on a schedule anymore. Being retired four or five years now, I don't really have a schedule. I kind of miss it sometimes because I like organized stuff, but not as bad. But my office is organized the way I work, and I do change it up, but everything is put back in its place, and I don't buy anything that doesn't fit in a slot that I don't have. Once in a while, I'll get something that doesn't fit, but I get it out of here. But people are wired differently. People have different ways of th seeing things. My grandpa said dirt in a house is not toys and dishes in the sink. That stuff it happens all the time. 
The dirt in the house is your cobwebs that look like ropes and your pile of dirt in the corner. That's dirt to him, but kids playing around, unbed, um, unmade bed, that's not dirt. That's not disorganized. That's just daily living. You're living in your house. I, I, I had two people that worked for me for years, 15, 20 years. They're programmers of phone systems and stuff. One was a wait and hurry up type guy. Great work. I mean, his stuff was always work. So I would build the engineering document and how it's going to work and stuff, and then I would give it to him. And he'd look at it. He knew what he had to do, figure it out real quick. He'd spend a couple hours on it, a day or two, and figure out what he had to do and break down his tasks and stuff and give it back to me. And I'd report it up the chain. This is what we're going to do. And then I would say, okay, this needs to be done by May 4th of this year. And we're talking January, so he's in his mind. He knows what he's got to do. The guy would start like the last week of April or right around, he knew how much work he had to do, so he'd start it late. I never asked him, got on him about the status, because whatever. He's not going to deliver it early. It's just the way it worked. And a lot of people didn't like that because of his initiative, they said. And they would hit him on his review and stuff like that. Whoa, 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 his stuff works. You said May, he's going to give you until May. He's working on other things and stuff. But that, that's how he worked. And if you tried to push him, it, it didn't work. That His mind worked as a wait and hurry up person. I'm a hurry up and wait. If you give me something to do, I'm going to hurry up and get it done, and then I'm going to wait till May. So he's going to do it at the end of April. I would have had it done by the end of July or end of January and just wait and tweak it up. Then I had another programmer, another analyst of tech. If I gave him something, an engineering doc, he would make it more than what it is. I had to watch him. If I told him I needed a database and this displayed this way and this call routed here, he would have a date, three databases, all these documents, this big query, and stuff like that. If I pulled him out of the equation, no one could understand it. So I had to catch him every two to four days as we're going through the project or every week and sit down with him and say, where are you at? And I'll say, no, get rid of that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Or add this. Don't do that. Because in his mind... He thought everybody was a te technical person and understood it all. So people are wired totally differently. Your organization is different to mine. You know, Jackie Jack and Boldy Grow and trying to learn this all see things they need to fix, but is it a priority to them? It depends how they're wired. Run your business the way you want to do it. You're doing this because you don't want to have a boss. If you like your house full of stuff and stuff all over the place, do it. I'm not one here to tell you you should be doing this. Like some people say, you got to put these up here. You got to put this here. You got to do this. You can't buy the little things. You can't do this. You can't have a thousand things in your store and stuff like that. I'm not that one. I'm just going to show you what I do and other people do. And you pick what you want. But I'm going to tell you right up front, my recommendation, organize your listed stuff and your process is how you list it. Get organized. Have do it in batches, but have it because you do not want defects, and you don't want to spend the time hunting for a postcard. You just can't find it out of 3,000 postcards. Catch it before it gets bigger. If you only got 500 cards, catch it now. If you got two cards, catch it now. How are you going to store these? I got videos on that. Look at other people. Do it now. You don't want to do it when you get four or 5,000 postcards listed. It, it's wrong. I've done it. I did it three times. You don't want to go, but you will. You will change up your inventory at two or three times as you do this. It's just part of the process. I, I see it in everybody. But look for these polls. Come out on Saturdays. Make sure you subscribe, like I said, and you'll get them. And there's a lot of good knowledge here. And I'll try to bring them in the videos, but now talk about organization. I have these laid out for the rest of the year. They're all scheduled. I'm not racing to put these up on Friday for Saturday. I have them scheduled into next year because I get these questions that pop my head or users will send me a question and I'll make a poll out of it and I'll just put it up online. So I'm not in a rush. That's just the way I work. Some people do videos the same day and put them right up. I, I batch videos. I'm a little bit ahead. I'm a little farther ahead now than I really want to be. I don't want to be way out because there's some changes that happen and stuff I want to put in videos. But I, I'm, I'm one that's to hurry up and wait. I'm not a wait and hurry up guy. You just got to decide who you are 
how you do it, and what you're happy with. And if I walked into his office and I had to move stuff out of the way on my desk every time I sat down, it would drive me crazy. But some people don't care. They like it that way. It doesn't bother them. Do whatever makes you happy and run your business. Just don't hurt your business with your listed stuff. And Be organized and you'll make money. A little bit more. Now we're going to get into the comments. Fewer comments come from emails, YouTube, eBay. I've had a lot of people lately message me on eBay. I don't mind that. It doesn't bother me. The problem is I have to be so cryptic in my responses. I can't send them to a link. I can't tell them my address. eBay does not like that. And I don't want to get uh, spanked for that. So if, if you're going to message me, try to hit me on YouTube or email at contactasmpostcard.com. I'll tell you to go over to the other place and, and send me something. That, that's just saying, I can't say go email me over here because eBay's bots are going to go crazy on me. Just be careful when you're at, um, so my email address is in the video description or it's contact at some postcards.com. Not a lot of people come in there, but it's, I, I don't mind it. It's just that I, I got to be so cryptic in replying to them. Sometimes I can be straightforward because it is right on eBay, but I can't send you to Ko-Fi for a document from eBay. They're not going to like that, even though it's free. But comments, I got three today. The first one, kind of interesting, came in an email and says, I was checking my eBay numbers. He's talking about his statistics and stuff for a store and his sales, and my impressions are way down. How is yours? I don't know. I don't look at that number. Very rarely, maybe once a month, once every two months. Those types of numbers right now don't drive any changes that I want to do. There's nothing I can do to change that. I got all this inventory and it's going to come in as what it is. There's been a lot of issues with people saying oh, my numbers, look at this big drop off on this date and this date. Something's going on, eBay's broken. I can't verify any of that. I don't even worry about views, watchers, or impressions or whatever. I have validated the sales numbers. The dollars have been good. I have a range, 20, 24, you know, 24 percent around 20. I don't break down all the cost on my spreadsheet. I just take whatever selling costs are. And if it equals around a certain number, when I look at it, then I know I'm good. If it goes like 35, 40%, then I got a problem somewhere. Is it me typing it wrong or there's a problem on the site? Someone, they charged me wrong or something like that, but that hasn't happened in a while. So I just use their numbers. That seems to be okay. These other numbers, views, watchers, impressions, clicks, I don't worry about any of that because you got to know how they calculate it and stuff like that and where that comes from. Just an example, I looked at my watchers before I did this video. In my store, I have 3,574 watchers. I'm always around 3,500 to 4,000 watchers in my store. How many views? I have no idea. I put something up, it goes out there. I don't care if it has 100 views, 2 views. Because it all rolls and it changes. They're constantly changing stuff. That doesn't bother me on things and watchers. A lot of watchers might be other sellers. Other watchers are just waiting for the price to go down. It's not. I'll send an offer. A lot of my offers go out automatically. As much as possible. I don't want to send offers. I, I send an offer to things. But I, I, I don't look at those numbers to drive any decision in my business. Now, where do they get these numbers? And why is the website not showing the right number sometimes. So when I worked in the technical world, I had a team one time that mainframes, they'd have batching. Mainframes were sequential, pretty much. They had what they call MIPS and all that. I don't, I'm not a mainframe guy. My team was. And they would put changes and stuff like that, and there'd be jobs running, but this job had to complete by this job and stuff. And they would update databases. But when you update a database, then the web team would come in and grab the number and update the website. What is a database? A database is an organized collection of structured information or data typically stored electronically in a computer system. Buckets. Pigeonholes. You're putting stuff in a database in a structured way of doing it. And it's usually managed by a database management system, Oracle, or something like that that does all this indexing and stuff like that. So that's the database. I'm going to get to here in a second where that means. 
Then there's the web page. So you got your database over here that has all the information, how many impressions you have, or how they count. They use all these numbers to calculate stuff. You know what your sales number. And they put that in a database. Then you got your web guys. They're not database guys. In my world, when I did it, I had a web team and I had a database team. So when the database team was done, then the web guys, I would say, hey, you need to go get that information and put it on this website every so often. And web pages back in those days were static or dynamic. A static web page to me is, I put a picture of my dog up on his birthday, my, his 10th birthday, and I leave that picture up there and a little story about it. That's that's a static page. It's not going to update from a database or change unless I change it. A dynamic database, a web page. What is that? What is a dynamic web page? A dynamic web page is a web page that includes content that is updated regularly. Dynamic pages are also sometimes used in e commerce sites, eBay, where the inventory or products offered may change frequently. You can take that information that changes in the database and put it onto a dynamic web page that reads that data every so often. It's not going to be real time. It might not even be daily. In the mainframe world, once the batch is done, it would update all this stuff and then update. it would refresh the page. So you got two different places. So what we're seeing on eBay, I think, the numbers aren't wrong. They're just being displayed wrong. The numbers in the database in the back end, I would say, are probably correct. It's just that they have the, the web pages, the guys that design that, ha are grabbing the wrong number. So that's what they mean about changes. If you make a change in the back end and it's not reflected on the front end, you'll, you're going to see two different things. A lot of database companies in the phone world that I worked on the systems, we never took anything away in a database. We always added to the end. How they, database management is a whole career. DBAs, database administrators, there's data scientists, people go to school, get doctorates in this stuff, and they can manipulate data like you wouldn't believe. They can show you a piece of data in, in a way, so many different ways, it's crazy. What you're seeing on the page might not be actually what's being there. It, it could be in between. Just give it some time. Don't, I wouldn't look at the, those numbers more than probably once a month. Let it update, especially at the end of the month. It's, everybody's doing these big things at the end of the month, these companies. Let it get into the second week of the next month before you look at last month. Let it all catch up because there could be returns, there could be postage labels, a whole bunch of different things. But I would not make decisions based off of impressions. But the database could be right and the web page wrong. But most of the time what I've seen with eBay, it catches up and it refreshes itself so don't get hung up on impressions next one is biff buff this is from the feedback in the last video about the 100 postcard store or the 100 postcard stores and the 100 non-postcard stores and i talked about i broke down the feedbacks on those two biff says who leaves neutral or negative comment and references price i don't know biff that got me unless they haggled about the price or they're trying to get a refund or something like that but i uh, leave a neutral or negative about price. They paid for it. They knew what they were paying for it. Unless they tried to charge them more, but I don't know. I'm with you. Anybody's got ideas? Leave a comment. Were they strong-armed into making the purchase? I don't know. That, that sounds right. Or they're just looking fishing for something. Good thing these people are small, small minority. Yeah, I, I've never gotten a bad feedback on price that I can remember. One, one of the very first eBay standard envelopes I have ever sent was damaged, and I thought, oh boy, it hasn't happened since. More than 20,000 cards later. Yes, yeah, the 100-year flood. Why base my business off of one postcard out of 20,000? That's what he's saying here. He's not making changes because he had one problem, and he's not losing sleep over it. I've had positive neutrals removed. Yep. And it took about one minute. I have... The feedback removal page bookmark and I'll put the link right down here but it's also in the video description how you can do that automatically and the feedback was eradicated probably three minutes later yeah some of those you can get removed and they'll come back and tell you now but the, there's a tool that you can use to get feedback and other things that eBay put together 
and I'll put the link here, but it's in the video description too. But thanks, Beth. Then Mark. This came in an email from Jim. And Jim wanted to tell me about my videos, and then also Jim's a regular viewer of the channel long term. There's a key point here. And it comes from my packing and mailing postcard video, I think. Not that I'm the perfect at it, but this reinforces why I do what I do. Mark, I follow you all the time and you produce some great videos. Thank you. Here's a tip for your viewers. So this is another long-term seller, viewer, bringing information to the community. Not just me up here talking. This is somebody else, uh, our peers, and this like-minded people is what this drives to make us better or experiences to help us become better. Here's a tip for your viewers of a feedback from a sale I made that was a postcard of La Haina Beach. That's an important card right now because of disastrous fires and stuff over there in Hawaii. People are very momento-y. They, they want to, how did it look, and keep some mementos and stuff like that. So those are pretty cherished right now. I've sold a lot of them. And to show how much postcard means to these buyers. It was also shipped, shipping, and the rigid Swift mailers. These are those mailers. Now these aren't waterproof. They're a little bit of water resistant, but they're not waterproof. They will get a little wet. And this is the feedback he got back from the from the buyer. Was pouring today, and the envelope was soaked from the mailman. So the mailman didn't put it in a place that it wouldn't be dry. I was so worried this postcard was ruined, but thank God you put it in a plastic sleeve. So, thank you so much, Vintage by Jim. So I always put my postcard, I'll sit there and I'll take the postcard and I put it in a plastic sleeve. Now there is a little opening on the end, so this part here could get wet, but most of the time when it's flat and air, it, it will help keep that dampness out of there. On there. So I always put it in a brand new sleeve so they can put it right in their collection and I just put it right in here. I don't put 10,000 things of tape on there to do all that. And you can watch that video of my packing and shipping and Jim is saying that worked for him. And he was probably doing it anyway before. This is not something new. Everybody is probably doing stuff like this. I didn't reinvent this. I'm not going to invent a wheel on how to pack. I just, I just like putting them in a clean sleeve in one of those envelopes. And I'm sure a lot of people have done that before me. So I'm not bringing anything new, but this is how it can help. If you're just putting it in an A10 envelope without any sleeve and stuff, it would have got wet, it would have got destroyed. Not saying this one could have not gotten destroyed, but there's a better chance that this one didn't. But thanks, Jim. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you on the next one. Here's some more fish. Bye.